Hello everyone and welcome to Key Strategies for Addressing Food Allergies in a Food Service Environment. I'm Amy Bybee, Corporate Marketing Manager for the Huber Company and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Just a few housekeeping notes um, before we get started. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of today's webinar, and we ask that you send your questions in throughout, this, uh, throughout the webinar today via the questions section on your screen. Um, if we don't get to all of the questions live during the Q&A session at the end, we will actually be doing some follow-up offline to make sure that we answer all of your questions. Also, just as a note, we'll be tweeting live during the webinar using the hashtag Allergen Awareness. So feel free to tweet along with us, um, and our address is listed on the slide. I'd like to introduce you to our panelists today. Uh, we have Beth Winthrop. She's the National Development Director for Wellness at Sodexo Campus Services. Carrie Anderson, Nutritionist and Allergy Awareness Advocate for Purdue University. Elaine McGee, Wellness and Performance Nutritionist for Stanford University, and Nancy Lane, Education Account Development Manager at the Hubert Company. Our key messages for today is really that addressing food allergies in your operation is possible, and that programs presented today are applicable to a variety of food service industries. You're going to find that the program ideas support operations of various sizes, from small facilities to very large. So what are you going to learn? What, what can you take away from today's program? We're going to be sharing examples of allergy programs that are currently in place. We'll be discussing key ways to communicate and train. We're going to provide turnkey smallware solutions that will help you implement an allergy awareness program in your operation. And with that, I'd actually like to turn it over to Beth Winthrop. Hi, thank you very much, Amy. It's nice to be here with all of you today. Um, I am a registered dietitian working with Sodexo Campus Services. And let's start out by just talking about what a food allergy is. So a food allergy is a negative reaction to a food protein, and it's moderated through your immune system. About 5% of our population have food allergies. It is more prevalent in children. Um, small traces of foods can cause food allergy reactions. They can range from mild reactions to anaphylaxis, which is deadly, and the reactions can be very, very quick, or they can happen hours later. 170 different foods have been reported to cause food allergies, but most of us know about the big eight. So the Food and Drug Administration identified the big eight allergens about 10 years ago, and the reason they chose these eight are because they account for about 90% of allergic reactions and most of the really severe allergic reactions. And these big eight need to be called out specifically on manufactured foods. For instance, if you have a product that contains sodium caseinate, the label needs to read very clearly that that contains milk. So the big eight are peanuts, tree nuts, fish, crustacean shellfish, such as shrimp, crab, and lobster, eggs, milk, including all dairy products, soy, and wheat. So everything that makes you sick, that's a food, is not an allergy. There are also food intolerances. And one of the things that can be confusing is that people sometimes say that they do have an allergy when actually they have an intolerance. So an intolerance that many of us would be familiar with is lactose intolerance. That results from a lack of the enzyme in our intestines that can, can digest the milk sugar lactose. So in terms of training uh, food service staff, we need to make sure that if two different people both say they can't have milk, maybe one of them is able to eat a little sprinkle of Parmesan cheese, maybe they can have yogurt because it doesn't have much milk sugar, where somebody else, even those um, very small traces of milk, might make them extremely sick. So another example of a bad reaction to food that is not an allergy is celiac disease. And again, we sometimes hear people say that they are allergic to gluten. Sometimes they just do that because it's easier than explaining the whole thing. But celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. And the little illustration in the upper right-hand side of the slide, you can see on the right 
That is nice, tall, beautiful villi on the lining of our intestine. That gives us a lot of absorptive surface to absorb all the nutrients that we need. On the left-hand side, that little illustration is short, stunted villi um, as a result of, of really poisoning by gluten. And that can result in malnutrition. So gluten is a protein that's found naturally in wheat, rye, and barley. It actually provides a lot of the nice structure we associate with, say, Italian bread, the big air bubbles, the elastic protein around those air bubbles is gluten. Gluten is also added to a number of foods as an ingredient, and it can be found in also a number of foods as a contaminant. So we've talked about food allergy, and we've talked about celiac. So how, are, how does that uh, impact us in food service? Well, there was a ruling in January of this year involving the Department of Justice and Lesley University. And basically what happened was a student or students who were required to participate in the mandatory meal plan at the university uh, didn't feel like they were getting adequate foods that met their needs for celiac disease and food allergy. It's a very, very interesting settlement. Um, and it does re result from that requirement for a mandatory meal plan. So they had to buy into the meal plan. Uh, I know the um, link for the settlement is at the end of this presentation. I really would recommend for everyone to read the entire settlement. It's, it's interesting. Um, so the two really interesting points about that were that the Department of Justice did categorize celiac or food allergy basically as a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So just as we would have to accommodate, say, a blind student uh, in our dining room, we also need to accommodate someone with uh, food allergy. Um, and the good thing is that this has given us more opportunity to focus attention on this issue with our uh, various administrations. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about one of the ways that Sodexo has worked to try to uh, not only accommodate, but really provide uh, an enjoyable meal experience for the students in some of our universities who have um, celiac disease or food allergies. So Simple Servings is the program I'll be telling you about today. Uh, Simple Servings is an option for resident dining, so it would be a platform or a station within a resident dining, um, dining room. And the goal is for us to provide safe and appetizing food choices that are ready when our customer gets there, so they don't have a period where they need to wait. Um, the preparation is very transparent to them. Uh, very few ingredients in the recipes. So customers with food allergies, gluten intolerance, celiac um, can all find foods that work for them. The station is also popular among students who just like plain, simple food. Uh, even students with type 1 diabetes who need to account for their carbohydrate servings and it's easier for them if it's not mixed with something else. So at Simple Servings, we don't offer any foods that are made with peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish, wheat, soy, milk, and eggs or with gluten. We do allow fin fish. That would be the only one we allowed of the big eight. In addition to uh, purchasing the correct foods, using the correct recipes and menus, we also pay a lot of attention to cross-contact. So dedicated storage, dedicated prep areas, service areas, again, trying to make that food preparation as transparent to the customer as possible. Um, and you'll hear, hear more about the dedicated smallwares that are really great visual reminder. So one of the main things we need to do to make this work is train, train, train. And I'm very happy to say that Simple Servings did win Food Management's 2013 Wellness Concept of the Year uh, this year. So uh, it, it makes sense to lots of people, which is really nice. So the menu for Simple Servings is simple. So it basically starts with a plain protein. It can be beef, pork, chicken, turkey, fish. It can be a plant protein, but we have to be careful there. We can't serve tofu because that would be soy. Uh, tempeh is wheat. A lot of the veggie burgers have wheat or soy, so um, we have to be careful. So we have a gluten-free starchy side dish. Again, lots of choices, potatoes, rice, corn, quinoa, um, kasha, which is buckwheat, which is actually not a wheat. Um, gluten-free rice noodles, um, plain vegetables. Again, there's no butter, no margarine, no cheese sauce. Um, and it works well. Simple Servings works well 
um, incorporating a salad bar or an action station. Breakfast is pretty difficult because it's difficult to do with just those, uh, those plain foods. And we are trying to show students that this is something they could figure out how to prepare for themselves as well. So staff training is really, really essential. It's important to really walk the space, look at the details of where things are going to be in the storeroom, in the coolers. Again, looking to have everything as separate as possible to role play through food prep, seeing what things might be touched, what things need to be um, segregated, and again, using those visual reminders such as the, the purple small wares to again show that everything does need to be separate. So systems need to be individualized because everybody's got their uh, individual physical geography. And the systems that we develop need to work in short staffing situations. They need to work when we have product substitutions. They need to work all the time uh, because the cost of error is obviously very, very high. It's excellent when we can have dedicated staff uh, who work on the simple serving station every day. They get to know the students. They really take them under their wing. Uh, they may chase other staff members through the kitchen and say, give me back that purple spatula. That's mine for simple servings. Um, but all staff in the kitchen need to know their basics. So one thing I really like, I've, I'm stealing this from my friend um, Betsy who, who runs Menu Trinfo, and she says one thing to really help people develop a good sense of judgment around allergens uh, and gluten is to think of those foods as raw chicken juice. So we've always, um, we've always done a lot of training around food safety with our employees in the kitchen, and I think people you know, freak out if we spill raw chicken juice and make sure we clean and sanitize and do all those things. But maybe they don't feel that way for just a tiny little um, piece of flour. So teaching that way, I think, helps people develop their own really good um, judgment, and that's important. So thank you to, to Betsy Craig for that. And with that, I would like to hand over to um, Carrie Anderson. Hi, I'm Carrie Anderson and I work at Purdue University and I'm a nutritionist and I'm also an allergy awareness advocate for all of our students here at Purdue. Oops, I went backwards. Okay, so I'm going to start off with our, some of the food allergy programs that we do. And one of the main things is communication, so connecting with the student or prospective student within your organization. And I'm just going to talk about our nutrition and allergen project team and also our food allergy fair. So how do food allergies affect the individual? So this is kind of a funny cartoon. It's not you, it's your sandwich. Uh, colleges are ready and willing. Uh, in schools to help students, but we also have to realize that having food allergies has a huge emotional impact on the students that we serve. So how does it affect the individual? So the impact on adolescents and young adults, uh, of course you know adolescence is a time for risk taking and food allergy students are no exception. They don't want to be considered different and they want to be with their peers and not isolated because of food allergies. And some uh, in grade school or even uh, middle school have been isolated at a peanut-free table. So now is their chance to really feel like they're fitting in. Uh, and a big part of the problem is uh, they'll be negligent in carrying their medications because this age group is the highest risk for reaction because of not carrying their meds. So by helping these students, we give them the opportunity to experience living in the residence halls just like everybody else. So speaking of medications, I thought it would be a really good idea to show you, some people might know, already know of the EpiPen, and you can see those at the top of your screen. And then the bottom one is called the AviQ. And this is an epinephrine auto-injector, but I'm going to, I have a trainer, I don't have the real ep, the AviQ with me, and I'm going to play it because it talks to you, it's really amazing. This trainer contains no needle or drug. So when you pull off the red... You are ready to use pull off red safety guard. To inject, place black end against outer thigh, then press firmly and hold in place. Five, four, three, two, one. Injection complete. So this is a pretty amazing um, auto injector in that it talks to you. So if you 
if somebody's freaking out because somebody's having a reaction, this can talk you through it. It also is about two of them together about the size of a pack of cigarettes or a deck of cards. So it's much easier to carry for students. So these are two forms of epinephrine that you can look for if, if you see a student or somebody having a reaction. So the students are off to college with food allergies. So the food allergic student is looking to the staff to provide ingredients to prepare uh, preparation information so they can make informed decisions on what to order. When your student was at home, there was always a safe option. So they could eat a safe meal before uh, an event, and then they could avoid eating out. My son, who's 16, has a dairy and a peanut allergy, and he rarely eats out when he goes with his friends. Uh, that way he doesn't have to worry about standing out by telling them he can't go and eat at that restaurant. He just goes ahead and orders a Coke. Um, so now the students in your residence halls are immersed 24-7 in an environment that has unknown options and unfamiliar people. And these students have been taught from an early age not to eat food that they've never tried before or they're unsure of. So again, uh, the emotional impact is pretty high for these people. So it has to be a partnership between student and food service staff. And when you begin a process with a student, it has to be a work in progress. Things change during the school year. Their allergies could change. They could have less or they could develop more allergies. So you need to keep the communication channels open. I try to meet with the students at the beginning of the semester at the food allergy fair that I'll talk about. They fill out a student profile that we keep in our food allergy notebook. Now this is not medical information and food allergies are not covered under HIPAA. So to keep general information about your student and their food allergies is okay. Uh, again, you have to review procedures periodically. Reach out to the student and ask them. Don't wait for them to come to you. And explain to them that if a reaction occurs, that you really want to know uh, that they had a reaction so that you can keep it from happening again. Uh, I offer to keep the students updated via phone or email, or they can call into the residence hall. Um, I have an iPhone, so I have a smartphone, and I have two students that uh, have pretty severe allergies, and so they really text me every day, and we talk about what they can have because I have to prepare uh, the meal for them each day. So another reason why uh, a phone would be a great option to use is if something happens where there's a change in an ingredient or you get a different uh, vendor comes in and gives you a different brand and you want to communicate that to the student so that they know when they come in if it's something they've been eating every time not to eat that food. So a little bit about Purdue University. Uh, it's a big place here. We have five dining courts. Our students can eat at any of the five dining courts and we have 150 to 300 students and 30 full-time employees at each location. And our freshmen are not required to eat in the residence halls. So between these five dining courts, we serve about 15,000 meals a day. But we are still required to provide reasonable accommodation to anybody that chooses to eat in the dining courts. So the next slide shows a couple of stations that we have at Wiley. The one up in the corner is our Churrasca, and it's a Brazilian barbecue. And the great thing about the meat on the barbecue is a lot of it is just uh, roasted there, and all the meat that we serve is gluten-free. Most are free of some of the big eight allergens, but we can also put the meat on plain without any spices or any rubs or marinades to keep it plain for, for certain students. Down in the left or in the right-hand corner uh, is our pasta station, we have a 12 burner, and that pan has a purple handle, and that you're going to see purple popping up more and more in a lot of establishments. And this is how I make sure that the students uh, know that they're getting an allergen-free meal. And this one is gluten-free. We use penne and rotini pasta as our regular pasta in our pasta station, but we only use elbow macaroni. So not only do we use purple to sign signify that it's a an allergen meal, but we also use a different shape pasta to help alert the staff and the students so they can visually see that they're getting the right, uh, they're getting the right pasta. Uh, we use the allergen kits in our pasta station on a daily basis. Uh, a second thing that we do in the pasta station is our, our utensils are also wrapped in saran wrap just to keep them uh, extra clean. We also expanded one of our stations to a no meat, no wheat station. 
So we're starting small. We have a big vegetarian population, and this tends to be really popular. And then we're also keeping wheat out of the station to help students that are trying to uh, eat a gluten-free diet. In the background, you can't see it in the picture, but we have a small refrigerator to store uh, thawed meat and condiments students might need. And we also have a gluten-free toaster. So. For the Leslie ruling, one of the things they said is that Leslie had to have pre-order, the, the students would be able to pre-order meals. So some of the things we do at Purdue, even though we're very large, is when I meet with the students and develop a relationship with them and we go over the menus, we're able to find things that I can modify that they can also have. I had gluten-free Korean shark, which was just a change in the marinade. Uh, we can always do plain fish for students. I can stop the ribs. Our ribs have margarine, and our margarine has dairy. So I stop the ribs at a certain uh, point in preparation to keep it uh, dairy-free and gluten-free for the students. And then this year, we started serving uh, individually wrapped four-ounce chicken breast, plain hamburgers, and pork loin chops. And these have been a huge help for us. They slack out quickly. If the student calls you in 15 minutes, you can have it thawed. And then we can cook it uh, in an allergen-free pan or on the grill for them. So these, uh, these pre-ordered meals are something that you know, we work ahead of time with each of the students. And the other thing that we can do, too, is we have uh, the gluten-free toasters for areas. Before we developed our No Meat, No Wheat station, we were struggling as how to keep our toaster gluten-free. So the purple cart is a toaster at Wiley Dining Court, where I work. And the one in the box is at Ford Dining Court. And it actually stays under the counter, and it's locked. Uh, and that we found that's the only way to keep the toaster gluten-free at that dining hall, because it's just so busy. And they're completely self-serve, our dining courts, and cross-contact is always an issue. So many colleges are choosing to add dedicated space when they do their renovations. So when you don't have an option to do a renovation, you have to be creative. And again, the purple cart, uh, you could use, put a toaster on that. You could keep any utensils on there. And that was a way to kind of carve out a dedicated space. We're also planning on putting a small freezer to keep cookies, cupcakes, and gluten-free pizza crust in our uh, pizza station to keep it handy for the students when they ask. The other thing that we developed at Purdue, because currently Purdue doesn't have one dietitian that's over our dining and catering department, so we, de we developed a nutrition and allergen project team. So we have one representative from each of our five dining courts, and we uh, meet and share information on new products or recipes, uh, keep updated about the students, and keep the information updated in our food allergy notebook. Again, we don't have any medical information in the notebook, and it also allows the one person in that hall to be a resource person to the other people working in that dining hall. The other thing that is a wonderful way to get to know your students and help teach them about what you have in your dining halls is have a food allergy fair or some kind of a gathering at the beginning of your school year. It's a place to distribute information uh, about the gluten-free and allergen-free options that you have in your dining halls. And I collected emails during the summer during our freshman orientation and also during our like we have Purdue for me or introducing Purdue and that's when students come uh, for tours during the school year and I handed out an informational flyer uh, to students about the food allergy fair so the students gathered in one big room and they were to get all of their questions answered we had one administrator from every dining hall to explain the gluten-free or allergen-free options and the best way for them to get what they need from each dining hall. I offered some gluten-free and allergen-free snacks. You can see cupcakes up there. I explained the allergen kits and the, and the reasoning behind the purple utensils and why if they have severe allergies and someone is not using purple utensils, they should question that and told them that by using the purple utensils, it can decrease cross-contact for them. So the most important thing for these students from and my perspective is communication between the students and communication between everybody at the university. So marketing, marketing, utilizing your marketing team to get the word out as many ways as possible to help capture these students so that they know they have options. Um, keep information at the admissions office, your disability services office, information on your website, and make sure your campus tour guides can answer to those questions because we can't risk uh, 
missing these food allergic students. The other thing you can do is uh, Seaboard and Net Nutrition. Uh, Seaboard Bartender can be utilized to create a database of labels. And what this does is helps to uh, cultivate relationships and education, and it builds the trust for students with gluten and allergen-free diets to eat in a large operation. And now I'd like to turn it over to Elaine. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for being with us today. I am the Wellness and Performance Nutritionist for Stanford University. Um, I want, I'm going to tell you about a few things that we've been doing at Stanford to better serve our students with food allergies. And I wanted to start off with our nut-sensitive dining hall called Ricker Dining Hall. And it's been that way for 10 years. It was actually inspired by a, one singular student <laughs> 10 years ago that had a peanut allergy. And um, through that, we then opened a nut sensitive dining hall and at that time um, and it continues to be peanuts and tree nuts are the one and number two food allergies at Stanford. This hall was through a thorough special cleaning was converted to a nut sensitive facility and a chef was hired who was trained around nut free cooking which I think was pretty unique ten years ago. The dining hall manager was and is a registered dietitian She's actually been there for all 10 years, and it was actually her decision to make it nut sensitive instead of just peanut sensitive 10 years ago. And I, I think that was brilliant because um, it really does become, you know, it does cover those one and two allergens on our campus. And no matter which dorm community a student lives in, they can eat at Ricker Dining Hall for some or all of their meals. I wanted to point out a few challenges. Um, although every effort is made to keep Ricker free from nuts, they do sometimes use products that are produced in a facility that processes nuts and peanuts. That's, that's that last big challenge. Every year the number of students with nut allergies does increase. And I've noticed since being there that definitely some nut allergic students still choose not to live in this community with, um, with the nut sensitive dining. And they choose to, to eat in the other dining halls on the other side of campus, which tend to be the freshman dining halls. So that continues to offer a challenge to all our dining halls, really. I wanted to show you a picture of what Rickard looks like this it's one of our smallest dining halls and this is about half the size you can there's a whole nother half you can't see on the right hand side um, but I think that helped because it's on the smaller side it's it's actually a benefit it helps them um, help keep control lessons learned over 10 years of running this dining hall it's important to teach students in the dorm community that they can't bring nuts to this particular dining hall and you can hit these students through dorm meetings, signage in places where the students will actually read it and the checker who swipes the meal plan cards needs to also be watchful for what students are, are bringing in with them, particularly in the be beginning of the year when everybody's you know, trying to get this message across. It's important to keep up employee training never never slack on this. This particular dining hall has a pretty solid crew of kitchen help. There's not a, a lot of turnover but even still keeping up on the training is, uh, is super important. The, the dining hall over the years has provided sunflower butter and soy butter. This is mainly for actually the non-allergic students that are using the hall and need a substitute for peanut butter. And I asked about coconut um, and about two students in the 10 years that the, the dietitian's been running this hall have been allergic to coconut in addition to nuts. So I just thought I'd throw that, that out there. Um, there are some meeting rooms in this particular dining hall, so they need to make sure anyone renting these rooms knows that no nuts can enter the building, period. <laughs> um, and we actually use this facility to make lunch boxes for our allergen students during our new student orientation because a good share of those um, lunch boxes are actually for our nut sensitive kids. So we use that as sort of our sort of our allergen sensitive uh, lunch box making facility. 
One of the other big directions we've gone to is our gluten-free micro kitchen uh, pilot program. And this is just the sign um, that you're looking at right now is the sign, the poster that literally is in, in our station telling them who can be part of the program, how do you get in touch with the nutritionist to join the program, um, and then we have our um, one of our standard disclaimers there. What you're looking at now is the actual micro kitchen station. It's off to the side of our largest, um, newest dining hall, and that way people can go off and get what they need in the general servery and then come to the micro kitchen um, for um, fill-in items for condiments, and then in the top two cabinets is actually the dedicated microwave and the dedicated toaster is on the right-hand side, and then in the cabinets below um, are cereals, microwave oatmeal, soups, bars, cookies, uh, rice packets, um, other entrees, gluten-free beef jerky, you name it, it's in there. Uh, I know because I'm the one stocking it sometimes. <laughs> and that, um, what you can see is that there's a, a key locks for the general station and then on the refrigerator and freezers it's a combination lock. So you do need to be trained um, to enter the program. You do need medical documentation now and um, you do go through a training to be able to use that station. We did um, a survey at the end of our first full year of the station last year just to kind of find out how are the students using it, um, with what frequency, so I wanted to share those results with you. When um, do these students use the micro kitchen, breakfast, lunch, and dinner? The majority is for dinner, the next is lunch, and the smallest amount, pretty not surprisingly, is breakfast, because I think that's one of the meals people can do on their own in the comfort of their dorm room, should they choose. We also asked how often they're using the gluten-free micro kitchen, and um, there was a smaller amount that are using it daily. I'm going to guess these were our seven celiac students that we had out of 34 last year. Um, a handful are then using it multiple times a week. There's a larger amount using it weekly and um, an even bigger amount that are using it less often than once a week. So because of this survey, um, these results, we decided to require medical documentation this year, mainly to make sure that it was available for our, our celiacs and students with the medical need to restrict gluten. Um, and let's see, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is on this slide, I think this was this is kind of an important point. We designed the station so that students would use it as a supplement to the general servery, and that's exactly how it was used. The, the majority of the students did say that they found what they needed in the servery, be it steamed rice, salad bar veggies, or dishes that do not contain gluten. Um, we do have a grill with uh, chicken breast, uh, grass-fed hamburger, gluten-free hot dogs, etc. that they can also get and then supplement in the station with the gluten-free breads, the condiments, um, free from contamination, and get their desserts and some of their snacks um, that are hard to find gluten-free in the general servery. So lessons learned one year later from running the gluten-free station. Um, like I said, we're requiring medical documentation now, and I think that will um, create a, a, a more dedicated student base that are going to be using it more frequently. We do rotate the types of foods and products stocked in the station to keep things interesting because they're literally with us for um, nine months out of the year. It's helpful to have the students go through a one-on-one -on -one training before given access, and that's basically with me, and I'm it's 10-15 minutes running them through it, and I can also answer questions about how different products are cooked in the general survey to answer their questions about the grill and the fact that we have gluten-free Greek yogurt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the other thing that I, I'm trying to do more this year is make changes in the general survey that will improve their food options through purchasing decisions, changing products, how things are cooked, etc. Um, don't overstock the station. If you put a lot of boxes of kind bars, for example, um, the students are going to, it gives a, the students a feeling of, I think, abundance, and they're more likely to take two over one, I think. So it's just keeping somebody there every day, checking the station, and we do use gluten-free interns to do that, um, and also to, to stock it from the storage area.
is helpful. Know your students. What is their usage? What are their preferences? What are their other food allergies? So that you can make better decisions in terms of what you are stocking in the station. And my last point is train, train, train. You can never train your um, workers in the kitchen, your managers, your chefs enough around gluten, around food allergies, around cross-contamination. The third thing that we've done at Stanford this past summer is design a special allergen awareness training for our workers specific to summer. Um, and here's just one of the, a couple of the, I'm sharing a couple of the slides from our training. And we did, we used the mini Aller train program from um, menu Trinfo that um, was mentioned earlier and they're able to customize it so we customized it to Stanford and our summer program. So a couple slides we added was why does the summer camp bring additional food allergy challenges and this is because the campers are younger and more likely to basically be messy. <laughs> Put serving spoons in different dishes, spill when serving themselves, double dip for sure, I know I see our college students doing this, when serving themselves margarine, peanut butter, jelly, um, ketchup, for example, on the spout, the big spout, everybody puts their bun right up to the spout. So even though the Heinz ketchup's gluten-free, I'm going to guess that spout's got gluten on it. So my advice is to have single-serving condiments available in your dining hall for your campers um, that have food allergens, just to be extra cautious. Campers may have their first reaction while with you at camp, and that's basically for two reasons. They're at the prime age when they may start having a sensitivity or reaction, and secondly, campers are exposed to foods for the first time sometimes when they're eating with you. They come from all over the country to come to your, your summer camps, um, and they could be eating sesame seeds for the first time, soy, kiwi fruit, etc. So lastly, for our summer training, at, at Stanford, I just wanted to kind of give you the overall um, counts. We hit all of our contingent dining employees that were hired for the summer um, through special trainings um, where they were getting trained on other things, food safety in addition, and then we just plugged in the, the summer camp food allergen uh, training along with that. We hit our bargaining unit staff during their um, group training but we also hit them in their, each of their locations in the dining hall with a separate training. Um, just reiterating, again, no, <laughs> they can't hear it often enough. It's so important. And we also hit our chefs and dining hall managers in a two-day training session that they had um, preceding summer and um, in an, an allergen training that was one in two parts. And last but not least, I would like to introduce Nancy Lane. Thank you, Elaine. I'd also like to thank Carrie and Beth today for sharing their information. My name is Nancy Lane. I have been with the Hubert Company for over 15 years. I'm a very active member of the SNA and NACUFS, where I serve on the Industry Advisory Board. I'm currently working with Campus Food Services to help them stay up with the industry trends, and I've been nicknamed the Lady in Purple. And I want to tell, today I want to cover the, um, talk about operations, communication, and some turnkey ideas. You know, using separate utensils has always been a standard practice. Using utensils that are this different color helps you to, helps to make everyone be more mindful of cross contact. You know, it's just a visual reminder for your staff as well as a person with a food allergy. Just like the picture with the purple handle and the spatula down at the bottom, Carrie covered that, talked about that at the pasta station at Purdue. You know, at Ubert, we designed the purple handle for the cookware. Every operation is different. There needs to be a variety of options to make it work for you. You've heard some different ideas today from the panelists. Remember that you can take away some ideas from this presentation for your operations, small or large. You know, some of the ways we want to talk about best practices for operation is do not use the same utensil, tray, or equipment for the allergen-free food. You cannot wipe it clean. So if you put that knife in the butter and then you butter the bread, you cannot wipe it off and then the next person coming along, it, it, they would get, it would be contaminated. Even dust and crumbs and steam from the allergen-containing meals can contaminate the allergen-free meal. No, you cannot cook it out either. If an allergen comes in contact with the allergen-free meal, it's contaminated. Just like Elaine was telling you about the summer campers and the double dipping, you will need to start over. So again, Purple signifies the special diets, the allergy zone, the prep tools and training. Chefware and aprons 
and purple draw attention to the staff and the special diets in the allergy zone. You know, one of the universities uh, we're working with uses the purple polos for the past two years for the staff and has been trained on the allergens and special diets. Plus, they hire students with food allergies or intolerances have given them great resources for ideas and training. I was talking to a chef and he said that was one of the best things he's ever done. You know, cookware and prep tools in purple say that you're taking the appropriate steps to um, ensure safety. Purple items removed from the regular service like dishers um, so there's no cross contact. So you know, I recommend that you take a look at your location and just make sure that there's no purple items out there that you're using every day so that there's no confusion and no cross contact. Purple, again, is just a visual reminder. There's nothing magic about the purple products, no special coating, just a way to separate your allergen zone from other areas. It's the same items that you're using today, just highlighted in purple. Okay, we're going to cover some things that you need to do. Make sure that you thoroughly clean utensils, the prep area, the equipment with hot soapy water, sanitize it before preparing an allergen-free meal. Make sure that you wash your hands and put on a fresh pair of gloves every time you prepare or handle anything around the allergen-free meal. You know, I was talking to a celiac and she said that this is the number one thing that people fail. They will go and touch something and then they'll have the gloves on and then touch something else. So anytime you do anything, make sure you wash your hands and put on another pair of gloves. Prepare or carry or serve the allergen-free meal separately. Again, um, use a clean napkin or a towel. Clearly label the dish or tray to prevent serving the wrong plate. This is an opportunity also to double check with the customer that you didn't miss something. So as you're handing the plate back, you may ask them, you're allergic to the tree nuts and shellfish, correct? You know, it's very common for someone to have multiple allergies and miss one or get, you might serve the wrong plate. Again, if you're in doubt, the kitchen server, when a student asks about how it's prepared, if you don't know, make sure you get a manager or a chef or somebody to come out and talk to them. Now here's some of the things not to do. Do not, serve the, um, the, do not cook or serve the allergen-containing food next to an allergen-free meal. Do not carry the allergen-containing food next to or over a pan containing the allergen-free meal. Again, you know, we talk about just a crumb or dust or steam. Do not prepare orders near the allergen-free meal. And do not label foods free of allergens if they have been prepared in a deep fryer. Use next to the allergen used to cook allergen containing foods. The example would be if you were to deep fry shrimp and then turn around and do some fries and a customer walks up and they're allergic to shellfish, they could have a reaction to the fries. Do not allow potential allergen containing foods to spill near against or in free an allergen free meal. Some of the things with communication, communication is very important. You know, you've heard from the panel today, they've shared some ideas on communication, that should be the number one thing that you walk away with today. Make sure you go back and do communication. There is all kind of labels out there, there's all kind of countertop menu signs. Again, you can see the checkoff labels and the gluten-free label there. Here we have the chef that's in the purple chef's coat and he's using the cutting board and he has the gluten-free bread. And one of the tips from the chef is that he recommends using the large purple pan and you can see that right down here on the counter and he will use that as his actual work surface. So as he's making a sandwich or making a meal or he wants to set something down, those trays he knows have already been cleaned. So I thought that was a great tip from the chef. And also here and now we're going into their bake shop and they're making the gluten-free cupcakes and cakes they do the baking at the station either when it's all the other stations are closed or before they open so not to have other food around the gluten-free food on the right hand side of the screen you can see right here that you we have the allergen kits you know one kit is for cooking and one is for baking the kits can be customized in a variety of ways you can have kits that work for just one station or can be shared among stations you can also have kits that can be used for one student you know if they have a severe allergy and the idea behind the kits is that all the items are stored together. Once they are used, they are to be transported to the dish room, washed, returned, and in the, the storage container, and the lid is closed. This is a simple way to keep the customer safe. I had the opportunity this uh, year to work on some remodels, and they have um, at KU, which is the University of Kansas, they have the KU zone. You can see up there in the blueprint, up at the top corner, um, they have their own refrigerator, dishwasher, their stove, their fryer in that area. And in that area, they're focused on vegan, meatless meals, um, gluten-free, dairy-free, kosher, 
and also plus keeping out the top, the big eight. Um, they just sent in some pictures. They've opened up and they're running now. Um, so they have the opportunity, again, to start with a clean area that they're using just for this allergen zone and special diets. And also, too, they have the no-way zone at Georgia Southern, and that's one that's opening up here shortly. So I want to wrap this up with some smallware solutions for everyone. You know, regardless of the size or type of your operation, Hubert has smallware solutions for the, your needs. The goal of an allergen awareness program is to set those products apart, from individual products to customized kits. You know, we can help you create an allergen, aware zone, allergen awareness zone in your operation. If you have the opportunity to do like a complete remodel and you're going to have a dedicated space, you know, just like Georgia Southern or KU, we can help you through that entire process. Also, too, if you're just setting up a small area, you know, it can be even just a cart like we talked about with the toaster in the cart area, we can also do that. You know, now that I've wrapped this up, I'm going to turn this over to Amy and she's going to continue on. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. All right, so um, I know we had some people kind of join us midway through today. Uh, so before we get into the Q&A session, I'd like to just kind of summarize some of the key things you've heard today. Uh, we've mentioned a variety of ways that you could address food allergies within your operation. You've seen a cart, uh, a station, all the way to an entire dining hall. You heard Carrie from Purdue speak about special order meals that are made to order for a particular student. Elaine talked about the gluten-free micro kitchen at Stanford as an opportunity to create a separate area for students who actually have medical documentation that they need to have access to that. And Beth from Sodexo mentioned simple servings being a station that any student with food allergies or without um, that they could choose to eat from. And all of these are great examples of possible ways to address food allergies within your operation. You also heard our panelists speak to the importance of communication and training, uh, whether it's labeling individual items or conducting the allergy fair that Carrie talked about at Purdue. Communication is really the key, um, whether it's among your staff or between yourself and the person who has the food allergy. Um, communication is definitely going to be one of the keys to success. And the training piece, too, you heard Elaine mention over and over again about you know, training is never, you know, it's never finished. There's always an opportunity to train, train, train. And lastly, you heard about the chef and dietitian tested and endorsed small wares from Hubert. Purple products that really visually identify allergen awareness areas and would help you successfully implement your allergy program. So we hope that you take away a few ideas from today's presentation, and we really believe that any accommodation you make is certainly going to make a difference to a person with a food allergy. And with that, I'd like to kind of move into the um, questions and answers. Um, you guys have been sending great questions in all along as we've been presenting today. Um, I'm going to basically throw these out to each of our panelists for them to address. But while we go through the questions and answers, I'm going to put up a contact uh, slide with contact information on it. It has contact information for each of our panelists. So if you have specific, excuse me, specific questions that you would like to reach out to any of the panelists on, the contact information is um, up on the slide now. Okay, so let's get started with some of the great questions that have come in. Um, and Beth, uh, actually, I'd like to kind of send this first question over to Beth, if you don't mind. Um, it's a question from Jim. Jim says, what advice would you give a dining court manager who's looking to implement an allergen program? What would your recommendation be? What's the first thing he should tackle? Well, that's a great question. Thank you. I think uh, the first thing I would do is really look at what your need is. So uh, do you have a lot of students with allergies? Do you have a lot of students with celiac or gluten intolerance? Are they there five days a week, seven days a week? Are they there for breakfast? So really think about what you need. And then do an assessment of what your physical space is and see what you have to work with. What do you have for dry and refrigerated storage space, prep areas? Do you have a little nook somewhere that you can really segregate out? 
Um, and what do you have front of the house for a service area? Are you able to convert an action station? Um, can you convert a current gluten-free station into maybe one that also doesn't have those big eight allergens? So what really do you have to work with for physical space? Um, think about menuing. Uh, do you tend to use a lot of convenience foods? Do you do mostly scratch cooking? What are your culinary assets? Um, even simple recipes or maybe especially simple recipes really do need some culinary talent uh, when you can't, you know, just pour cheese sauce over everything. You, you've got to really be able to cook it well. Um, and then, you know, look at what alternatives might work for you. Um, simple servings is something that we like as a, as a hot station, but that doesn't work for everybody. So you could think about the pantry type of system with um, a number of purchased items and then have that supplemented by having special items cooked to order for the student. Uh, is there a way for the student to call you in advance so they don't have to wait, all those different things. I think one of the most important things you really need is a champion somebody who really gets it, uh, perhaps somebody with experience of food allergy in their own family, but somebody who's passionate about this and really wants to be that student advocate. And of course, I would always say if you have a, a registered dietitian or a nutritionist that you work with on campus, that is a real bonus and very helpful. So thank you for that question. OK, thank you. Um, next question is from Lori, and Elaine, I'd like to kind of send this one over to you because it's about um, educating, and I know you talked that you don't have a lot of turnover at Stanford, um, but training is very important. So Lori's question is, how do you educate new employees and keep them up to date on your allergen processes and procedures? Ooh, I love that question. Um, and we do have turnover, by the way, just not in that nut-sensitive facility. That's just this awesome, tight-knit group. So <laughs> I want to just <laughs> explain we do have turnover. In Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trust me. Um, well, first of all, okay, there's a few things. I would add allergen awareness training, even if it's 15 minutes, to whatever training or onboarding is already going on. Um, so hook on in to something that's already um, in the system. And then I would plan allergen and food safety training at times when you know you tend to hire new or contingent employees. Like for us, it's before summer and before the academic school year. Um, that tends to be when new people are coming on board. And, and so get with your whoever's in charge of training and just get that on the books knowing that ahead of time. Um, and I think thirdly, I would include allergen awareness, the key tips um, and the reminders in any kind of weekly staff meetings that are already going on in the individual dining halls. And we've been doing this um, all year to supplement the trainings that we've been doing all year. <laughs> it's been a, a big initiative for us. And the really important tips we actually have translated into Spanish so that our our, our kitchen workers that are more comfortable with that language can actually, you know, just see those key tips in, in, their, in their native language. So anything like that, I, I would say, is kind of worth the investment. Um, but yeah, I hope, that, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Um, Carrie, we have um, two questions for you. Actually, both are, they're from two different Jennifers. The first question okay. is directly related to how many students at Purdue actually have allergies. And the second question is, um, the second Jennifer is interested in implementing an allergy program but is having problems convincing others within her, in her organization why it's important. And she wants to know what recommendations you have on how to sell the idea um, to somebody that's kind of up the chain of command. All right, well those are two really great questions. Uh, currently at Purdue, from the emails and students that I met with over the summer, I collected about like 44 people that have food allergies. That doesn't mean that we're helping all 44 because some of them learn the way around the dining court. They might just be lactose intolerant or they might just be gluten intolerant or just have a peanut allergy and maybe not need as much help. But I still, last year I captured about between 20 and 22 students, and this year it was 44, so it seemed to be up, up twice as many. So it keeps rising every year from here at Purdue. 
And the second question is also a great question. Uh, the most important thing that everybody needs to realize about food allergies is that they are covered under the, under the ADA. Uh, so the question isn't about selling the idea. It's, a, it's about how are you going to implement a program in your dining court or your operation to help these students manage their food allergies. Because if they come in and they are asking for reasonable accommodations, we're going to have to do that for them. The allergen awareness programs using, any allergen awareness program I think can be made easier by using the allergy kits. Uh, I don't know about other dining operations, but our cooks tend to be extremely organized and they're planning out their day. So by having these specific allergy kits, it helps them to stay focused on, uh, it helps them to stay focused on making sure that cross contact doesn't occur. And so that's how um, I would help sell it to the upper management, is you're giving these cooks the tools to help the students and then also keep the students aware of that they're, that cross contact isn't occurring and that also the cooks can also stay aware that they aren't causing cross contact to occur. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that answered it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great. Thank you. Um, and then, you know, we've had a lot of um, a lot of questions actually around the purple products specifically. Um, so, Nancy, if you don't mind, I'm just going to try to throw out one of the more generalized ones uh, regarding the products. It's a, Susan says, uh, we are interested in setting up an allergy area with the purple products. Where do we start? So if you don't mind kind of walking her through what that process looks like for you. All right. Well, thank you, Amy. Um, that's a great question. You know, um, I've had the opportunity to work on the remodels and some of the um, other universities and colleges for their dedicated space. Um, you know, one of the places um, that I like to start with is the menu and really talk to the chef, the manager, the dietitian and understand their menu and what they're going to be serving. You know, if you're just going to be doing the top eight, that may look a little different. And then also we talk about, you know, the gluten-free and the special diets. So really understanding that. And then it's just basically a walk through the area, you know, what area you're using and then what small wares do we need. We start making a list. Who are we serving? What serving utensils? Communication. So we really start a basic list and start working from there. Um, you know, you can put this program together pretty easy. And again, really, it starts with the menu. Um, you know, you're going to receive an, another way. You're going to receive a follow-up email from today's webinar. You know, and there will be a link showing you all the purple items that we have. And also, too, if you want to today, you can visit our website and you can look up our allergen collection and that will give you what we have right now. Um, so hopefully this helps you with getting started on a program. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Um, one other question that I wanted to throw out, both uh, for Beth, Carrie, and Elaine that came in. Lindsay asked, what's the protocol your staff must follow when a guest experiences a food allergy in your dining halls? Is your staff given permission to administer an EpiPen? So where, where do you guys fall on that with each of your operations? Well, this is Carrie. I can answer. Uh, currently, our first thing to do is to dial 911. We have uh, level two paramedics here at Purdue, and they're two minutes out. So thankfully, knock on wood, we haven't had to deal with that. Um, from what I've, t what I've been told is we're supposed to help uh, the student or the friend of the student to administer the epinephrine. OK, great. Elaine or Beth? Uh, this is Beth. Um, I think there's there's some variability because we are working with a number of different um, universities. Certainly, dialing 911 is always the first step for you know any medical emergency, um, and we do uh, train the staff on that. Also, train them on what the EpiPen looks like. Certainly, first preference is for the student to use the EpiPen themselves or have a friend assist them. Um, and, you know, different universities feel differently about it. Uh, what I say to people is, you know, if you come across a student who's lying on the ground and the EpiPen is, is right there next to them, it's nice to know how it works so that if you need to be a good Samaritan, you're not going to make it go off into your hand. Um, and they're, they're simple and, um, you know, the, the Avicu especially is 
talks your talks you through it in a situation where everybody is is very tense and nervous. So, um, to me, uh, knowing how to use an EpiPen is is almost sort of like a, a Heimlich maneuver thing. Um, this is Elaine with Stanford, and I've been training our students on what an EpiPen looks like and how a student would physically administer it to themselves. And I've been training them that if a student looks to be having a food allergic reaction, that the first thing they do is get another worker to dial 911. It's most important to say your specific location so help can get to you fast. And tell them that a student is have a, having a food allergy reaction so that the uh, paramedics can come with the proper tools in their hands. Meanwhile, nobody leaves the student, and you're, you're to stay with the student um, and to help them get find their EpiPen um, if, if need be and help, you know, help them find it so they can administer it to themselves. And I've been keeping everybody apprised on the bill that's going through um, Congress on you know, ma uh, mandating epi generic EpiPens be available, and certain states and counties, I think, have already done this, but it sounds like there's a national bill going through that um, they'll be mandating the EpiPens generally being available in schools, um, just in case. So we'll see what happens there. So far, we're, we're not impacted here um, in Northern California by that. Can I say, Beth, um, oops, I just wanted to, to stick in one other little piece of information, courtesy again of, of Betsy Craig, um, but another important thing is not to stand the person up and walk them. If you have a person sitting in a chair, sitting on the floor, uh, who's having anaphylaxis, the right thing to do is leave them where they are, not to stand yes. them up and walk them. It makes it worse. Absolutely. And one other important thing that I learned at the Food Allergy Research and Education uh, conference that I went to was, if you have to ask the question, the answer is yes. So if there's any question at all on whether or not people should use their medication, yes. Great. Great advice. Thank you guys so much. I think that really helps, um, you know, people understand where, where everybody is and what the appropriate measures are to take. So thank you for that panel. Um, and just for everyone, thank you very much. That kind of concludes today's webinar. We appreciate you participating. Uh, within 48 hours, you're actually going to get an email. Uh, and, you're, and within that email, you're going to have links to the recording of today's webinar that would also contain the slides, uh, links to food allergy resources, as well as a brief survey that we would appreciate you filling out um, by September 30th. So that's it for us today. Thanks and have a great day.